Well, first up, the normalization in bond yields following the Fed's announcement on QE tapering triggered a sell-off across all asset classes over the past month. Emerging markets came in for indiscriminate selling as investors opted for the safety of the US dollar. China's interbank lending squeeze added to global growth concerns at a time when the eurozone is still mired in recession and the IMF has lowered its global growth estimates. And David Galloway, strategist at Sunlam Multi-Manager International, joins us from Cape Town. For more, are we beyond the doom and the gloom, in your opinion, David? Um, well, good evening, Bronwyn. Uh, firstly, I think that what we've experienced over the last six weeks has been a normalization uh, to a certain extent. The, the, the bond market needs to, at some point, stop becoming a one-way bet. So, in other words, it needs to more accurately reflect the underlying uh, growth uh, of the economy as well as inflation expectations. So I think the initial knee-jerk reaction um, has taken place and, and the expectation really going forward is that it will be data dependent. Uh, the, the Fed Chairman has, has made that one very, very clear. And um, you know there will be a moderate uh, pace of increase in in yield in yields across the entire yield curve, but you know the important part to all of this is at the short end, the policy interest rate will remain anchored at very very low levels, um, and in the U.S.'s case, the the first increase is probably only likely sometime in 2015. So, David, let's just now, if you if I was to say to you from an investment perspective. Global equities versus local equities, which way would you go? Well, from a valuation point of view, we would still favor global equities over SA equities. But having said that, you must also bear in mind that uh, a rising tide does lift all boats. So insofar as global equities continue to rally, we still think that there will be an underpin for, for SA equities. But from a valuation point of view, and, and there are myriads of ways in which we look at this, uh, we tend to think that there is more value in, uh, in global equities. I'm going to ask and, you, and you now to be a little more specific on the global equity uh, scenario. Where specifically are you seeing the most value? Well, the, the interesting part, and it's, and it's the one part of the globe that is really battered, is, is Europe. Um, to our minds, there's, there's a whole lot of deferred alpha in that market and uh, you know we think it will only be a matter of time uh, before that that value gets realized and that could take uh, possibly two or three years we really do need to see that uh, the the eurozone starts stabilizing at these lower levels admittedly but there still are a number of headwinds facing that that region and that does tend to temper sentiment which is obviously an important driver of, uh, of global equities or, or Eurozone equities. Let's talk about Asia. <coughs> yeah, let, let me not interrupt your, your train of thought. Uh, your view on Asia? Um, look, Asia is also another area where we, we see quite a lot of value. Um, in a market like China, for example, we think China is, is incredibly undervalued. And um, it, it, we, we're not entirely sure what the catalyst will be to unlock that value. Um, but you know, that market is trading probably on a forward P of six and a half times, which um, even by historical context is still very, very cheap. So, you know, w w the catalyst there might well be um, focusing on the, on the whole policy arena of the new Chinese leadership. You know, are they going to continue to try and rein in the shadow banking system in particular. I mean, obviously, they would be concerned about systemic risk in the whole banking system. And uh, maybe that is their priority. We know that they are trying to liberalize the currency markets, uh, the capital markets, um, as, as kind of a prerequisite to them becoming a reserve currency country sometime in the future. But I mean, there, there's a whole lot of variables that uh, we think will, will ensure that China actually misses its 7.5% growth target for the year. But that doesn't mean to say that uh, companies are not necessarily making money. But surely um, that will, you know, that David, let's just focus on that. If we do miss that 7.5% growth target, surely the market will sell off across the board just because that will drive negative sentiment. I actually think that the markets are beginning to price this in. 
Um, uh, consensus estimates by all accounts are starting to be revised lower. So insofar as it already is in the public domain, um, the knee-jerk reaction to potentially these numbers coming out softer over the next couple of quarters uh, will, be, will be somewhat subdued. If we talk about the, the biggest risks to the, the global story right now, in your opinion, what would those be? I've had all sorts of things thrown around this desk, one of them being that Japan could implode. All right. Look, Japan, I think, is a, is a, is a structural story. It is a long-term problem. Uh, that they ultimately sit with. I mean, it's quite obvious that through their aggressive quantitative easing program, if they do succeed in getting inflation up to the 2% level that they have targeted now for, for you know, 2014, 2015, um, what will their long bond or their long bond yields be? I mean, if those yields are going to be pushing substantially higher from current levels, then it begs the question, will they actually be able to repay their debt? You must remember that Japan's uh, government debt is around 250% of GDP. They are the most indebted country. And uh, any significant backup in bond yields is, is going to increase default risk um, uh, on JGBs, the Japanese government bonds. But that is a longer term problem. I think in the near term, it is having somewhat of a desired effect. We, we definitely see in the economic data that there has been an improvement in, in that economy. Uh, I think it's still too early to say, is the economy reinflating? Because we still have deflation in Japan. Um, but the expectation, realistically, will be that as that monetary base expands and as the banks continue to lend out, that you will actually get some inflation at least creeping through into the economy. And that's very good. Uh, you know, Stay. the worst thing for corporate earnings, sorry, Bronwyn. The worst thing for corporate earnings, my apologies. Is deflation uh, in any economy because corporates have no pricing power. So at the end of the day, you do want a bit of inflation um, because that does give corporates a bit of pricing power. You spoke earlier about the, the Eurozone and the, the value to be found in equities uh, potentially across the board in, the, in that territory. What about the risk of a deepening recession in the Eurozone and that leading to a run on the banks? Absolutely, Bronwyn, that's uh, one of the, the bugbears that we currently have for the region as a whole. And it really relates to the so-called bail-ins um, that uh, the European Union has now reached common ground on amongst all the EU finance ministers. So basically, in the event of a bank bailout or um, you know, a bank potentially being in trouble, creditors, bondholders and depositors are potentially stand to lose money. So, so much like the, um, the Cyprus uh, scenario where you had bail-ins, um, in other words, uh, individuals with deposits in the banking system in excess of 100,000 euros, those could be at risk. Um, so it's really against that backdrop. If this is now becoming common EU policy on how you deal with bank failures going forward, um, it is very conceivable that the rational Joe Bloggs, the, the person in the street, will actually try and withdraw their excess funding from the banks. Now, that, that in itself means that bank lending will actually slow down in the region and, and potentially deepen the recession. I mean, one of the single biggest concerns is that your negative growth in lending is actually accelerating on a monthly basis, and that's the worry. So um, there is undoubtedly um, possibly uh, the need for a rethink, uh, or alternatively, they would need to increase the uh, deposit insurance level uh, that they have in, in Europe. Uh, David, just uh, looking here at uh, a document that uh, I've received from your team, uh, the, t the statement has been made that money market rates at odds with South Africa's economic fundamentals. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, Bronwyn, yes. You know, following um, the initial talk of Fed tapering, um, and the possible exit of quantitative easing in, in the next year or so. And then I guess coupled with that, um, the liquidity crunch that you had within the Chinese interbank lending market, uh, the net result of all of this uncertainty is that we saw our own 
um, money market rates, the, the short-term money market rates, and here we typically talk about the FRAs, so um, the 6 by 9 FRAs and the 18 by 21 FRAs, they went from a position where the 6 by 9 FRAs were expecting almost a 25 basis point cut in interest rates. This was towards the back end of April. And um, following all this tapering concerns, we actually, within uh, the space of a couple of weeks, the FRAs started pricing in uh, the probability of a 50 basis point increase in six months' time. And uh, out in the 18 by 20 to 21 FRAs, so in other words, three month interest rates in 18 months' time, those had pushed up to 2%. So they'd gone from 5% to over 7%. Uh, that to our minds was clearly a mispricing uh, of risk and a mispricing of the economic fundamentals in South Africa. And I think when, uh, when Jill Marcus uh, gives some feedback after the Monetary Policy Committee, I'm hoping that she will be adopting uh, a dovish tone uh, in the statement and uh, hopefully we start seeing the money market rates returning to more normal types of levels. I mean, it's, it's, it's not in our base case scenario that over the next 18 months we're going to see interest rates rise by 200 basis points. We don't think economic growth is strong enough for it and we don't think that inflation is going to breach the 6% target uh, range um, barring you know, uh, one or two months uh, in the third quarter, we just can't see that happening on a sustainable basis going forward, notwithstanding uh, the recent depreciation in the RAND.